Welcome to Global Perspectives. What is Uganda's role in Africa today? For insights, we turn to Patrick Ibembe, Special Assistant to the President of Uganda. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Patrick. Thank you very much, John. Why don't you tell us a little bit about your life growing up? Everyone always talks about their current jobs, but you, you have an interesting background that our viewers don't know anything about. And we'd love to hear from you about what it was like growing up and how you ended up as a special assistant to the president of your country. Oh, thank you very much, John. Uh, it was very interesting growing up in that part of the country and, and in that part of the world in particular is one of the most interesting things. I was born in Jinja, uh, which is the second biggest city in Uganda. Uganda is in Africa, it's uh, situated in Eastern Africa. Uh, I was born and raised in Jinja. I went to local universities there, Makerere. And when I was in Makerere University, I was one of the very best students. So having sat for the interview at the Public Service Commission, they told, they told me, you know, our Patrick, the president retains the very best. So uh, then at the time I was a student, uh, I st had studied and graduated in literature and political science, but I also had another diploma uh, in education. So that's how I ended up in the presidency. I started by serving many roles there. I was uh, an administrator. I went uh, at the rank called a senior assistant secretary. That means a senior administrative officer in the office of the president. That is pretty much uh, an administrative role. As an administrator, it's about decision making, making sure uh, that you give administrative support to make sure that His Excellency the President and the presidents as a whole does their work effectively and efficiently. Uh, after doing that for quite a while, uh, we've got uh, 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 in my office, we had a minister in charge of the presidency. We have the president at the top, but we've got a minister who runs the affairs of the presidency. So I was uh, uh, taken to serve as a personal assistant to the minister in charge of the presidency. After a year and a half, uh, we're talking of 203 then, I was named the personal assistant or chief of staff to His Excellency, the vice president. It was a very interesting role and uh, it involved me traveling a lot. There was a lot of work to do. Well, then I had to take off a little bit of a break, studied and uh, did many other courses. Then the president appointed me a special, a special assistant to the president in charge of special duties. Now, was this something you anticipated would happen or was it a bit of a surprise? And what, 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 what was in your mind when you were told this would be your next opportunity? One of, one of the most pleasant surprises that had ever happened to me at the time. Uh, we live in uh, a democracy which stipulates that uh, the president is the fountain, of, uh, the fountain of honor. So as a child growing up, I thought I wanted to live in the clout around the presidency. And I really thank God. Uh, it's one of the things I used to uh, pray for. And it came as a pleasant surprise, I must say, John. Well, and no doubt you have multiple responsibilities and, and a special assistant always has the opportunity to take on something new, I would imagine. So if you go to work on any given day, you may be told, oh, well, here's something else we'd like you to fix for us. And, and you have to take that on. Help our readers or our viewers understand, because many of them know a fair amount about Sub-Saharan Africa, and some know less, but, but help us understand where Uganda is in the context of, of East Africa and the world. role that it has played. Oh, thank you very much, John, once again. Uganda uh, is situated in East Africa. Africa, of course, as you know, is one of the continents that make up the world. Every, uh, I hope all our viewers know where Africa is. Uganda is located quite in the middle. Uh, on the west of Uganda, it's bordered by a country called Kenya. Kenya touches the coastline. Uganda is landlocked. Uh, our access to the coast, to the East African coast, the Indian Ocean, is through Kenya and another neighbor of ours uh, down to the south, that's Tanzania. Uh, then uh, we've got uh, to uh, the west, we've got 
uh, DR Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo, we usually call it DR Congo. Uh, then South Sudan, which is the newest republic in the world, uh, I think that's on the north border. Then we've got Rwanda, uh, uh, which is uh, further southwest. So that's in terms of location of Uganda, that's where it is it's part of, it's in East Africa and bordered by the countries that I've mentioned. And you have a very large famous lake Oh, in yeah. that vicinity that I think most everyone has heard of. Yeah, Uganda's got uh, Lake Victoria, a very, very, very big lake. Uh, they usually say, the Ugandans say that it's the biggest in the world, but uh, I'm told it's the second biggest, but it's not a debate. <laughs> yeah, so that's Lake Victoria. And it's also home to River Nile. Mm, one of the longest rivers in the world. Mm -hmm. It starts from Uganda. The source of the Nile is right into Uganda. Those two water bodies are uh, quite significant. Ab absolutely. So, so given your location and given the, the fact that your president currently is so committed to democracy building and development of the economy and having peaceful, stable, and secure relations with Africa and with the rest of the world, what are some of the issues that you face on a daily basis? If you go into the president's office, what, what is the kind of thing that might come up without getting into the sensitive aspects, but just generally, uh, what, what might be a typical day? What, what would be the issues that would be placed on the table? Okay, well, issues that are usually placed on the table, I agree with you, John. Again, context-based, given uh, that uh, the challenges uh, in that part of the world, certainly many of them have to end up uh, at the president's table or to the attention of the presidency. Uh, there are two things. We are talking of the president and the presidency. Many times the president runs his work through the presidency. The presidency is a little more spread. So you find that the minister in charge of the presidency will have some issues. There is a minister for security in the office of the president will have issues. So many times you end up uh, having a lot of work coming from above and from uh, fellow, I mean, from, from ministers, as the president may have delegated. Typical day usually involves about analyzing issues based on the priorities of the country. We run a democracy, which is a very, very, very big thing, and we are committed into uh, dem uh, democracy. Then we are also for regional integration. Uh, Uganda, as you know, is a country of about 40 million people, and the East African region is the fastest growing uh, economic block on the African continent. That one has also come in. Uh, our, pres our president has been extremely supportive towards such issues then many times when we have issues that are also relate to uh, East African bloc, regional blocks, uh, like uh, African Union, international, our uh, issues that they relate to international, our inter I mean, a commitment to, inter to the international community and uh, world blocks, they also come in handy. So a uh, typical day, uh, John, I must say, many times is guided by <laughs> many factors, yeah, but uh, we've got issues that usually uh, are of a planned nature. You'll find that maybe you've got uh, such and such a paper to contribute to that will be discussed at the African Union. It could be very important, but not urgent. So imagine issues that keep coming in from our region. There is maybe something that is sensitive to carry out in Sudan or what you can, you end up placing many of those uh, efforts as they come in. But basically, we, are, we look at the challenges uh, that we are faced, the opportunities and challenges that we are faced with, then we profile. Now, your country, because of its location, is inevitably a crossroads for mm -hmm. people traveling from one neighboring country across and, and other places for a whole variety of reasons. And some of that is caused by political disruption in neighboring countries, some of it's caused by other things, but how do you prepare for something like that? If, if there is you know, trouble, unrest in a, in a neighboring country that spills over into Uganda, is that something that you monitor on a daily basis so that you're always prepared to respond, or is it something that you respond to 
on a case-by-case -case basis? What, what, what is sort of the, the general, again, without getting into mm -hmm. sensitive matters, what, what is the general planning uh, method? Oh, thank you very much, uh, John. Again, as a country, we are all committed to one, th one thing as a, as a baseline. We are committed to regional peace, regional development to begin with. Before we engage, certainly we, world peace and development comes in handy. But uh, to answer uh, your question, uh, we've got, for instance, I will take you back a little to one of the lines. Uganda is right now home to about one million refugees from Sudan. That's what I was yeah, we've got uh, there's a lot. Of, we've got an open door policy to to some of our neighbors, to, to most of the people who are in trouble. All refugees, for instance, will enjoy all the privileges in the country minus a right to vote. They have to, you go to the same school, they will get an education, they will get food, they will get sheltered. Uh, so there's that kind of acceptability. So many of these roles, we've, uh, we sit quite often and keep profiling. Certainly we do prepare and budget for resources to cater for some of those emerging uh, issues as well. But it's basically the leadership. The leadership is so open that... Uh, the, the, and very supportive to such initiatives. What about, and I don't know if this is something that falls to you and, and your office, but what about issues related to the environment and the changing climate, which we have seen rather dramatically in many parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, and that in the future, if it continues, will lead to even more refugees than have been displaced by political conflicts. Uh, according to the scientists who, who study this. What do you do or what do you think about relative to the environment and climate change, if that's a responsibility for your office? Well, it's not a responsibility for my office, but it's a responsibility for our government. Climate issues to do with the climate are extremely high on the Ugandan agenda. It tickles down, for instance, you cannot get any approvals come through for a building plan in many times if you do not have an environmental impact assessment. We are signatory to most uh, issues, uh, sorry, to, to most protocols that relate and protect the environment. Uganda, for instance, has got, uh, uh, we've got a whole ministry committed to environmental issues and we've also got various uh, agencies that are almost at a level of ministry uh, that focus particularly on environment. So environment is one of the key issues uh, that our country in particular uh, focuses on. Tell us about uh, the evolution of democracy in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Democracy is one of those challenges that everyone in the world who thinks about a democratic system encounters and many countries have worked with democratic systems for a long time but no one seems to have gotten it exactly right just yet mm. so what what are some what have been some of the initial challenges that you faced in establishing democracy in in Uganda and what are some of the challenges that you face today mm. oh thank you very much again John democracy in Uganda I can say as as you've mentioned uh, we can't say we've perfected it, but we've come a long way. Uh, I must say again, uh, the government is committed towards uh, democratic governance as a principle. There is certainly rule of law as opposed to arbitrary rule that we had decades of years ago. We've had, we had successive regimes that were not sensitive to democracy. Uh, we follow our constitution. Uh, I mean, the constitution of Uganda came into force on the 8th of October 19, 1995. That's the supreme law of the land. It provides for clear guidelines when it comes to democracy. And uh, at we carry out regular elections at all levels. In fact, uh, some people keep cracking jokes. This is a joke that we over-democratize. There's leadership, people participate in choosing their leaders. And I must say, John, one of the most free and fair elections uh, in Uganda. Very transparent, everybody participates. We've developed systems that are very, very transparent. And we are committed to strengthening them even better. 
uh, our many of our institutions keep coming all over, they travel all over the world to benchmark good practices that we can borrow. Because we really believe that uh, a good democracy is a foundation for development. You, there's no doubt about it. Yeah. And it's, it's a right of the people. <laughs> and it's really it, right. it, it mm. is, and, mm. and it's not always mm. fated for that mm. to happen in any one country. And, it, and in Uganda, in a, in a relatively short period of time, you moved from colonial status to these authoritarian systems to mm. the current democracy, all in, what, 55 years. I mean, that's a, that's a relatively short period of time. Mm. And, it, and there are people, many people alive, who remember mm. the old days mm. and what it was like during colonial times, during I, you know, the, the uh, authoritarian times. So um, how do you help them understand mm. that the current system is better, if you want to cast it under the better umbrella, better, more uh, open to opportunity than the previous systems were. Mm. No, thank you very much again, John. There's a lot of sensitization that goes on through all kind of media. And I can assure you the Ugandan population right now has never been informed more than, uh, better, I mean, more than it has ever before. Uh, for instance, the Electoral Commission which is the main body that is charged with uh, the responsibility of carrying out elections into uh, uh, the democratic elections, has got lots of resources uh, that go into education, vote education. They, they come up with various platforms from social media, from uh, TV shows like these, from uh, local FM stations. In that part of the country, people still listen to because they literacy levels are not uh, that high uh, in some areas. So people still listen to the, um, to the radios as they go down to work on their, on their farms. So there's a lot of interest and there's a, there's a lot of sensitization. And I, I must assure you, John, people are politically aware. They are very, very sensitive of their rights. And this is shown by the numbers that keep Come show show up uh, when it comes to any election, right from the uh, election of the first office from the presidency to their local uh, leaders uh, on the village. There is usually a lot of interest. You've got to people end up moving a lot. Beat even the current president. You have to have a clear manifesto to sell to the people in order for you to be elected. That wasn't the case some time ago when democracy had just come, a few people could just see it and decide for the rest. But this is so participatory. And uh, it has also been, it, the government has put the framework so that uh, democracy is deepened to the last. We've got a lot of support from uh, our donor community. A lot of money comes from this part of the world that helps us in democracy. And we really appreciate uh, the lot of interest and the resources that are put uh, and that we gladly accept to make sure that we deepen uh, democracy in Uganda. And that one, I can assure you, I think uh, it's a one-way traffic. I don't see us g getting back. Talk to us a bit about your experiences with the other British Commonwealth countries. Uh, we, we were talking before we started a little bit about mm -hmm. how different it is slightly from country to country in terms of the way English is spoken and so forth. But uh, w what are the types of relations that you have through your office and, and through the presidency with other Commonwealth countries? Uh, I must say, June, the relationship is very, very, very good. Uh, Uganda is so key and uh, very supportive of most of the initiatives as they come through from the Commonwealth from time to time. We've got excellent relations. We've literally had no trouble with uh, at the Commonwealth. I do not see, we've not seen any trouble coming through or issues that have emerged that have put Uganda uh, in a situation where they doubt our commitment to, to whatever is resolved in the Commonwealth. So uh, certainly the Commonwealth is uh, it's like a brotherhood. Everybody speaks one language and we like it one uh, <laughs> very much as opposed to African Union is local and uh, we support it very much. But uh, for African Union, 
you have to put earphones here. You cannot engage the one engaging with John. Uh, because another one will be talking Francophone, another one has Portuguese. And, uh, to answer your question, there's a, a lot of warmth. Warmth in terms of relationship and res mutual, res mutual respect when it comes to uh, Commonwealth. Let's talk a little bit about your favorite area of interest, your, your academic focus, and mm. just, maybe just a little bit because we, we want to make sure our viewers follow what we're, mm. what we're discussing and have an interest in it. But you're very much interested in management, administration, and issues of that kind. Tell us a little bit about what your focus has been, especially at the higher graduate level, and maybe some insights you've learned from that. Oh, thank you very much, John. Uh, this is a very long topic, uh, and, uh, but I will try for purposes of our viewers, I will just give them an insight, the rest we can discuss. Uh, well, as you said, uh, I started working with the president, as I said at the beginning of the interview, it was very, very, very exciting. But I realized that issues and challenges that characterize the management and administration of these VIPs had never been systematically investigated, studied, or documented. Pretty much they could get uh, John here, who has been the best student in class. I said, oh, John, you've been the best in public relations. Let's manage. Uh, Patrick, you've been the best in uh, administration. You can manage the administration. So beyond that, uh, because I'm talking of now close to two decades of working there, uh, that people had never been um, uh, fed into fundamentals of managing upwards. Communication to the VIP, communication for the VIP. So my study came up, uh, has come up with data, frameworks, and techniques that are needed to manage people at that level. Uh, issues to do with communication that strengthen. How do you communicate? to the VIP, for the VIP. They, they could be small things that either make the office shine or <laughs> the other way around, the, the exact opposite. Uh, if John, for instance, is the president, and John is here, uh, we've had many occasions where somebody says, oh, he, uh, His Excellency John, no, when he's around, you say Your Excellency in spoken production. If you're writing, you say, His Excellency. We've talked about issues to do with palace politics. There's a lot that happens. These VIPs live like kings and queens. If, for instance, they're in democracies like Africa, because our constitution says you are the fountain of honor, you can come up with lots of privileges. So managing the personality of those people uh, is a very challenging detail. So the, fo the takeoff was about that. Mm -hmm. Uh, managing fundamentals of managing upwards. Those are the frameworks, data, and techniques that have been systematically investigated, published, and that's my focus in PhD area. I, I would very much enjoy talking to you more about that um, mm. as we continue afterward. Tell us a bit, um, as we come to the close of our show, uh, about your travels. Is there a part of the world, you're in the United States now, is there another part of the world you plan to visit soon? And is there one country or two that are maybe at the top of your list? Mm. Thank you very much, John. I, uh, I've traveled, as per last week, I've traveled in 54, 54 countries mm. around the world. Other destinations like United States, England, over 40, 60 times. It's interesting because uh, we have to engage into, uh, as we've got these asymmetrical relations between countries. So many times we are benchmarking good practices as we travel. So uh, my work as a special assistant and also as a chief of staff to the former, it came with lots of travel. Many times where the president or vice president could not be, you are sent there to Uganda, engage into these forums that can make you market Uganda or a debate on behalf of the country or at times benchmark some good practices. So uh, I love traveling as a child and uh, I have got other memoirs that I think I can share with you. It's called Life on the Jet mm -hmm. that details in my travels in many of these countries. But I should update then I traveled in 52 countries. I should put the 54 then hand over the memoirs to you, John. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us today, Patrick. Thank you. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia, and we'll see you next time.